Good day, everybody. My name is Sheila Weiss, and today my topic is going to be about Treaty Number Nine. And you may ask, where is Treaty Number Nine? Or you may know. But uh, I'm going to show you on this map here where it's located. It's located from this area all the way down to Western James Bay and Northern Ontario. And what we're going to cover is the historical content of, of the Treaty Number no. 9. And uh, I'm going to show you a material culture that came from there before Treaty 9 was signed. And graciously, the, the material culture that you see here is located on the Grassack database and also at RUM. Physically, it's in the RUM building. And as you can see, this beautiful glass beads uh, hood, it has three, ver like three uh, versions, the front and the sides. And what makes this so beautiful is that the women handmade this. They beaded, they used their motifs, and they were expressed in their, their artistic side. And I would like to share this. So if you would like to go to this, uh, to this website on Grassic, the information is here for you to uh, look into. Today, we're going to discuss what led up to uh, the Anishinaabeg and the Omishkegwak people to sign Treaty 9. It wasn't simply that they just wanted to sign number uh, Treaty Number 9. There were prior things that were that was happening to them, and uh, out of that, they were hoping that would, they would get protection, receive protection from the government because they were uh, being encroached upon. People were coming into the trap line and they were taking their, their furs or they would uh, destroy their, their traps. And also people that were coming there that, were their, that was in their area, they would um, poison the animals and uh, so they could get fur quicker, like the animals, they would poison them and then they would take the fur. And also the people were starting to feel ill, like their health was deteriorating. They would have influenza, measles, and TB. And uh, this was very um, serious because people were starting to, to pass. And this was decimating their their nation. So this this signing of treaty was in hopes that the government would help them with the health and also with policing. So that was what they were visioning. But rather, um, they were taken advantage of it because of that. So as you can see on my slide here, there's a number of reasons what. Um, what led to the signing of Treaty 9. And most importantly, I would like to share that uh, because of, um, you know, the CNR and the ONR, they wanted to um, have settlement across the country all the way to the west and also into the north. So they started to build uh, the, the railways. So it would be able to come in and out of Moosonee from Cochrane and also through the northern area to to um, to the west, like from Toronto all the way down to Alberta. So this was also another reason. And also, um, Mr. Williams, he was a, a, a Hudson Bay factor. He also alerted uh, the government about uh, a um, someone that came there to uh, to survey the area. And the person that came there, he told uh, Jabez Williams that there were some kind of uh, natural resources in that area that was abundant. So he wrote to uh, one of the governments and told them that uh, there's a lot of resources in this area. And that was in Osenberg, Osenberg, Northern Ontario. So he alerted them and then the people from that area, like the government at that time, read his, uh, his I was going to say email, read his letter, and then 
they suddenly had this interest. So they also, because of uh, the St. Catharines Miller, because, you know, the, the Ontario government and the federal government, there are two governments. One, the federal government is for the, uh, for the Indigenous people, and the Ontario government is for the Ontario area. So when they decided to sign Treaty Number 9, they needed the Ontario government to be on board with their treaty. And at first, they weren't. So they convinced them by letting them know that that um, there was a lot of natural resources in this in this area. So of course the Ontario government at first didn't want to sign this treaty and then it took some convincing and then eventually they did. And out of, um, and one, they put one condition on this. They said, well, we want our Ontario uh, commissioner to come with the, the federal commissioner. So they made a deal. So in addition, the Ontario government also had more of a negotiation than the indigenous people of uh, Treaty 9. They already set what they wanted and it was no, um, it was hard, like hard printed, like it wasn't, there was no negotiation that's going to happen. It was set in stone. So when the, the commissioners went to these areas, they weren't allowed to negotiate, but as they went to these areas, they were saying they were going to negotiate. So that alone was a misconceived, like they were made to believe that they were going to negotiate, that it was going to be, you know, an equal standing, but it wasn't. So my next slide, as you can, you could read this here. My next slide is close it. Now you may ask, who were the commissioners? Well, the commissioners were named at the time, Samuel Stewart and Duncan Campbell Scott. He was from the federal government and Daniel George McMartin, who was the Ontario um, commissioner. And uh, like I said, it was, they were coming in for a purpose. They were there and as you can tell, they did it within a summer, like the First Nations that they ne negotiated with. Here you can see three pictures. The first one is uh, a group of people coming in on canoe. They're paddling into the First Nation territory. And during this time, in the journals, it was mentioned that uh, the commissioners were uh, making, like, you know, the the flag, they were shaking the flag to make it look exciting and somebody was blowing a horn and then they were making it exciting for the people to see that they were coming and that something major was going to happen. It was exciting to, to sign this treaty and, you know, it was a big celebration. And then here are the commissioners here. You can see uh, the two police and then the doctor and the commissioners. They were sitting in front of their TP or their uh, tent, and this is where they were staying. They were posted outside of the Hudson Bay area when they did have to, in fact, spend the night. And then the bottom, this is what happens after they signed the treaty. They would have a big celebration, one-time feast, and eight dollars for each person that was there, and they would uh, also have uh, the Okamaus there as well and then they would negotiate with them privately either in the Hudson Bay uh, quarters like inside their office or somewhere exclusive but that's not what the Royal Proclamation said it was supposed to be a big gathering in front of everybody and everybody is supposed to be included and the negotiation is supposed to take take place in the public space which didn't really happen that's another thing that wasn't uh, wasn't uh, fair, I guess, or maybe it wasn't followed through like the Royal Proclamation had said. In addition to all this, um, the people that signed the First Nation, I mean the, the Treaty Number 9, received a Union Jack 
a flag, you know, like the British flag. And they were also um, given, um, they were supposed to have their treaty, but they didn't. And we'll go to the next page. Here's a picture of it right here, as you can see. The, the young man that's standing there, he's using, I mean, he's covering himself in a Union Jack. And then he's also got um, an emblem right here. And that was part of the part of uh, the negotiation. And in addition, all the territory, Treaty 9 territory is one of the biggest ter uh, territories. It's two thirds of Northern Ontario. So you can imagine that's a big, massive land that was that the government received from 1905 to 1930. They did like two years in a row and then they, they added an adhesion to the treaty number nine. And here on the treaty, you can actually see people signing either with a cross or their name. And you can also see syllabics here. Now that's concerning for me because if they were able to write their name in syllabics, why didn't they write the treaty in syllabics? Why didn't they have like get someone to write the treaty so they could read it, so they can understand what they're si signing, instead of you know relying on uh, people's uh, interpretation or in interpret you know from English to to Ojibwe or Cree. Like they could have wrote this in Cree or in Ojibwe in syllabics and they would have understood what they were signing. So that's another issue that was that was wrong with treaty number nine. And here, as you can see, before treaty nine was signed, that these young girls were were playing outside and they were having tea in Bannock. And then over here you can see the mothers close by. And they're also eating tea and bannock. And another thing too, you can see their hoods right there. I don't know if you can see it, but the women are wearing their hoods or some kind of hood. So there is like a parallelism with the other beaded hoods. So it's beautiful to see that here. And you can see how happy they are and how engaging they are with each other. And, you know, they're really, um, engaging they're, they're talking and peop the kids look really happy here as well and then the next so when the commissioners had um started to to let the indigenous people of northern ontario know what they were going to receive they were going to be able to hunt and fish in their territory as long as no one is living on there and in addition they had regulations. They were supposed to abide by the rules um, and also like the Ontario Ministry rules. Um, in addition, they were supposed to also um, receive education for their children and uh, live in these homes that were built for them to have, you know, on the reserves, these permanent homes, along with the um, like running water and electricity so this was one of these promises that they were they were given and also they weren't allowed to choose where they to live because according to the ontario commissioner well the ontario ontario premier at the time was saying that they didn't want first nations to live too close to uh waters like flowing waters because they wanted to use that in the future for hydro lines. So they weren't allowed to live in those areas. And they were, so they tried to pick areas that they wanted, that they're familiar with, you know, their summer camps or places with water and they weren't allowed, which is unfair because that's their area. That was their seasonal camp. And they knew that area and they knew what they could, how to sustain themselves in this area. However, they were also promised like homes, like I mentioned, and these homes eventually they turned in, into disasters. Like for example, now there's mold growing in there. There is insufficient uh, 
Plumman because his young lady here, um, she was sent out to Toronto and then they told her, um, told the parents that they weren't uh, keeping their kids uh, clean. But when they came back and then the nurse again, or the community, they sent them back out again to get a second opinion. And then in this time, they found out that they were getting skin rashes because of the running water, because of the plumbing. It was had nothing to do with uh, the detergent or, you know, how the parents were keeping them. It turned out it was bad plumbing. And uh, not only that, you know, the food that go up to these up northern areas are very expensive. Like a bottle of uh, detergent for us in Toronto is about, what, 10 bucks? And then up north in northern areas that are excluded, you know, excluded, that are um, either fly-in communities or by train, their, their produce and also their cleaning products and their water, even the bottled water are pretty expensive. So that alone is not fair. And how are these people going to, you know, continue to, to live like this? And it's not right. It's very unfair. Not only did the government um, offer to give them permanent uh, residents like the reserve and, you know, build, construct homes. They were also promised to get provisions for uh, education and uh, provisions to, to pay the teachers and construct buildings. So if that happened, why did Shannon Quistagen have to advocate for Attawabasket in Northern Ontario? for all the Northern Ontario uh, classmates to have a safe, clean school. She had to have a call out to all her peers across Canada to help her um, so the government would take them serious. And at the same time, Shannon had to travel to another school. She had to travel to another Northern Ontario past a place, uh, I think it was past Yerko Falls. And, um, during her travel, she um, she got into a car accident, not her, but the driver got into a car accident and then she didn't survive the car accident. So she wasn't able to see the school that was built now. She, she wasn't able to see her legacy. The school was built because of Shannon's initiative and all the other children that helped. And that's pretty sad you know that children have to advocate on their behalf the treaty wasn't being honored at that point here are the names of um all the places where the where the treaty uh where treaty nine is located for example Osenberg. so the time here that that the treaty was initiated was in july 1905 uh, Fort Hope, July 19th, Martin Falls, July 25th, Fort Albany, August 3rd, Moose Factory, August 9th, and then there is New Post, August 21st, in Matuan, uh, June 2006, and Abitibi was June 7th, 1906, and then also Flying Post was in July in 1906, and New Brunswick, July 16th. So that's really close. They must have been not too far from each other. And then Long Lake and then the adhesion. And all in together, like I said, it was two thirds of Northern Ontario. So you can see the, uh, here, you can see the blue where, it ha where they signed and then the green in 1906. So the Indians continued to hunt and fish on their traditional territory to provide for their family. And Duncan Cam uh, Campbell Scott had said that they were able to do that as long as the sun shines and the water runs. But he didn't, the treaty doesn't say that. It says that it was regulated and that wasn't given. That information wasn't clear enough for them to understand that. If it was written in Cree, I'm sure this matter would have been taken care of 
they would advocate and they would have negotiated. Instead, now this is what you see compared to the earlier where I showed you, you know, they were on the shoreline of James Bay. They were in their seasonal camps. They were probably fishing in that area. And there was abundant of trees and nice land, you know, that was that was able to give them uh substance like you know fish moose meat and rabbit but here as you can see this is what it looks like now you can see the detour mine or i think this is uh the diamond mine in natawapiska and the clear cotton so this is different from the way it used to be as you can see and then they also said they were going to share share the you know share the wealth but this is not share the wealth all they're having is like you see like you seen earlier homes that are becoming moldy and education is not as par not up to par like you know this urbanized kind of education and then the la the land look at the land here it's pretty sad so you can just figure out if treaty nine was uh equal to what the government's receiving and Canadian people. And, you know, from the resources, natural resources, the, the economics, it's supposed to go back to the First Nation, but it's not. And then people are saying that, you know, their tax money is going to Indigenous people, but clearly it's not. And look, this is what's coming from, this is uh, Indigenous uh, land, like from the Treaty Number no. 9 people. And are they getting any of this revenue? I'll leave that up to you to think about it.